A couple months ago on one of our date days, Pastor and I were driving along in St. Louis and we passed a church, a pretty church. It, uh, it's not a church like ours. It was a denominational church and it was beautiful. And I was like, oh, that is so cool. And I'm always, you know, on my phone, Googling stuff, everything. Like pastor will say a word and I Google it. You know, it's like, I do that. So I'm looking and I was like, I want to check this church out. I want to see what they're about. So I get online and I'm looking at them and, you know, they had all of this cool, they had programs and all of these great ideas and I loved what they were doing. And so then I'm flipping and I'm trying to find their, their belief page, you know, like what they believe. And so I clicked on what we believe and I started reading and reading and reading and it was just all sweet and love and community. And I'm thinking to myself, where's the scriptures? Well, this is, you know, this is, this is a decor, you know, something that I would read about a nice community association. So I'm saying, where's the scripture? And I kept reading and reading and reading, and I never could find it. Where their belief page was, I, there, I just didn't see any beliefs based on word. And so what I heard in my spirit, I heard this in here, sinking sand. You say, we're living in a time which is, it's exciting time for the church. I just, I want to tell you before I get into the word that this is the most exciting time. I was, I was telling uh, one of our um, security on the way in Alton how exciting it is that the Lord chose us to be alive for the great end time harvest. Isn't that exciting? That to me is so exciting. But at the same time, if we are not building our life on God's word as believers, it can be very fearful time. How many of you like surprise parties? Okay, I want a show of hands. You got to like connect with me a little bit. Okay, I can see that. Okay. <laughs> um, I, for one, hate them. Okay, so this is a heads up. I've had many surprise parties in my life. Um, precious, love my family, love my friends, but by the way, I do not like them. <laughs> and I think it's because I've always kind of been, I want to be prepared kind of personality. I've never been a fly by the seat of my pants person. Not that if you like surprise parties, you're like that. No, some people just love that. But I've always been kind of a little bit like that. And so I started thinking about God and how he is with the church. I don't think he likes surprise parties either. And the reason I say that is because he warns us over and over and over in the word about what is coming to those that are living in the last days. So God loves us so much that he wants to not only prepare us, but he wants to not just prepare us to not be grieved, which we are grieved and what we're seeing happening in the world, but to prepare us to be the church because we have the answers. We have the answers. And so what I'm seeing in the world is this herd mentality. I, I had to go to the word because sometimes you hear the word, hear the word, hear the word, but when you're actually living it, you're going, we're living this. Do, do y'all remember those movies? Um, I think it was called Left Behind. Do you remember those? We need to crack those out again. <laughs> because by the way, there will be a generation of people that will be left behind. And people have been saying this for 2,000 years. Uh, you know... I know he's coming, but if the early disciples were worried about the catching away of the church 2,000 years ago, we should be very aware that we are in that generation. You know, I always look to what's happening with Israel. 
Now, the Lord says in Scripture, in the prophets, talk about how Israel would come home. Look what's happened with Jerusalem and Israel. That is a sign of the times. That is a sign of the last days. There's many, many signs. We right now are in a really cool season in the Hebrew calendar. God has these holy days in the Old Testament that I love the Old Testament because it's a type and shadow. Do you realize there are some prophecies that haven't yet happened yet that were prophesied in the Old Testament? Oh, they're coming. But the holy days, the wonderful holy days of God that he instituted, if you can read them about, about them in the book of Leviticus uh, 23, that Jesus fulfills them. And many have been fulfilled. And we're right now in the middle of the high holy season. It's called the Feast of Trumpets. It's so cool. You can read about it in the Word. But it's, it's, it's the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets will be the catching away or the rapture of the church. And the blowing of the shofar is, was very, very important in the Old Testament. And it means a lot. There are a lot of, uh, we've blowed the shofar here many times. I want to I wanna get that back. I blow it at home. We've got a couple of shofars. We have a, Joel is amazing at it, by the way. Um, but there's a long, you know, if you've been to our house, he always cracks out the shofar. Joel loves to blow the shofar. I mean, and I think it's because he's so good at it. He wants to show everybody how awesome he is about it. But I just teasing him, Joel, if you're watching. Um, but we got a little one and a big one. And what that meant was the king is coming. When the children of Israel were around the Mount Sinai, there was a supernatural horn blowing in heaven. Moses came up to the mountain and the Lord came down to fellowship with Moses. It's a type and shadow of the catching away of the church. Right now we're in that holy season. It started Friday, the Feast of Trumpets. Rosh Hashanah. It's so exciting. And so really at the time in Israel when they would celebrate that, there were, there were several meanings. I'm looking at the, from the New Testament version of the catching away. But it was a, a, a season of time called the season of awe. And for 10 days, Feast of Trumpets to Yom Kippur, which was the Day of Atonement, they would, and they're doing this today in Jerusalem, they're doing this they would be weeping. They would be repenting. It's a call to repentance. It's a call to mercy and forgiveness. It's saying, wake up, wake up, wake up. They're doing that now. And I think on the actual day, they blow like a hundred times the shofar. And so I feel like prophetically what God is saying to the church, he's blowing that shofar and he's saying, wake up church, wake up church, wake up church. I was watching I, you know, like I said, when I was looking on that website and the, I felt like the Lord spoke to me, sinking sand. We're getting away in the body of Christ from the time-tested teaching of the Bible, the doctrines of our faith. Jesus said about himself that he was the word. And in John chapter 1, 1, this is about Jesus. I, have, I want us to remember this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. It's still the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The world does not understand us. And we're to be light bearers. This was talking about the Father and the Son. Jesus was the living word of God. And when he was walking on the earth, something that was very disturbing, and as a young believer, I remember reading this and going, this is so weird. He had the most confrontation with the religious leaders of his day. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, Jesus had constant conflict with them. And these were the people, if anybody should have known who he was, it should have been them. They had the scriptures. It's like I'm saying, where's the scripture? 
He was the living word. They should have recognized their savior and they didn't. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Of course, Jesus uh, would not have been considered politically correct in this environment. He's still not, by the way. In Matthew 23, Jesus, I just, I, I encourage you to read that. He confronts the religious leaders and he calls them blind guides, hypocrites, whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. How would that fly right now? Uh, he calls them snakes, vipers. They were beautiful on the outside, but filled with evil intent. And he says of them, you are of your father, the devil. Now in John 8, 31, I found this very interesting. Jesus was speaking to the Jews, to, you know, the Jewish people. And it said that Jesus told the Jews, this is verse 31 and 8, he told the Jews who had believed him. They were believing what he was saying. He said this to them, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now, how did they respond to this? Now, remember, Jesus told the Jews who had believed him. So he was talking to people that had believed him until he got to this place. Until he said to them, oh, and by the way, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Oh, we love our salvation, don't we? Praise God, I'm not going to hell. I love Jesus. Oh, I love him. I love him. But the Lord doesn't just want to be your savior. He wants to be your Lord. And being a disciple of Christ is not something that you can say, I'll take me some of this and not some of that. These people were so offended that he told them they had to continue in his word, that the truth would set them free. And pastor always says, when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you walk in to your salvation covenant. You're stepped into the door. You have this wonderful covenant. But God expects you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And this is what a lot of people in our era do not want to do. Jesus in the crowd one day, a woman called out to him. This is in Luke 11. Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and who nursed you. And Jesus immediately responded to this woman. He said, blessed rather are those who hear my word, obey my word, and practice it. So he was saying, he was making, and this happened several times with Jesus and his family. There were a time when Mary and, and some of his half-siblings <laughs> Where were there wanting to speak with Jesus and he did not stop the work that God gave him. He didn't give ear to that. He knew who he was and what he was supposed to be doing. And so Jesus is making it very clear that the word is the most important. He says, heaven and earth will pass away. They will pass away. The, the form that we see, but his word will never fail. It will never go. We are living in the Isaiah 520 generation. Isaiah the prophet says this, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he was warning him. Now, I want to say this to you. I, I probably won't get through all of these passages about the last days. And, 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 you know, but what I want to say to you is Paul addressed it, Jesus addressed it, Peter addressed it, Jude addressed it. Now, these were people who were in the beginning of the last days. And if they felt it was so important, if the Holy Spirit felt it was so important, he was pointing, and much of the Greek is a future tense. He, was, he had you in mind, church, when he was writing these words through the early apostles he had us in mind. Aren't, isn't that exciting? He said in 1 Timothy 4, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, seducing spirits, and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. 
The word expressly here means this will emphatically take place. The word latter times, the Greek word for this, means the ultimate end of a thing. Last of the end of the church age, the end of the end. What will we see? Well, it says that some will depart from the faith. Now, some, the word some here means a notable sum. It means a notable sum. And it also gives the intent of people that you probably know. You've seen faces. You've heard them preach. They've been around. They used to be right. They used to be on. They used to be in the word. They used to preach the gospel. But they're, they're departing from that where they once stood. It says some, a notable some, will depart from the faith. Well, now, this is the confusing thing. Let me, let me give you a clear picture of this. The word the faith here being used is not talking about faith for miracles. It's not talking about faith for finances, faith for getting your kids right. We all need to stand in faith, right? All right, faith for things. This is talking about the faith, your Christian faith, the time-tested doctrines of the Bible. It says some in the latter times will depart from the faith. Now, this word depart is also not meaning rejection, at least not at first. The word depart is this. It describes, it's called apostasy. See, a lot of times when we read this, we're looking for people that deny Christ. And if you keep going in this, you would ultimately end, there will be some that do. But the word apostasy, when it says depart, it's not talking about a complete rejection. In fact, most people in this place will claim, I am a Christian. Let me give you an illustration. This is my word. This is the, my faith. This is the doctrines. Those, those tenets of the Christian faith that I've stood in faith and believed. The apostasy is this. It's slowly... Remember, I'm, I'm clinging. When I first received Christ, I am just so in love with God's word. I remember being a baby Christian, on fire, devouring the word night and day, day and night. Do you remember your first love? Do you remember that first love for the Lord and the word? You wouldn't let go of it for anything. It was your life. We're not ashamed of the gospel. What I'm seeing is people that are Christians being ashamed of the gospel. They're watering down the word. And where they once held it so dear, they loved it, they cherished it, you couldn't pry it from their heart. They're, the word depart means they are letting go of their position. I'm still a Christian, praise the Lord. I love God, I love people. And slowly, they're letting go of something to lean in to something else, huh, well, I know the Bible says that, but, well, you know, I kind of believe this new kind of philosophy. I still love God. I still love the word. It's the, what I was reading on our date, right? And they walk away, and they don't even realize how far away from the word and the tenets of their faith they have gotten. How do you know? What is the sign? It's how, how do you view sin, how do you view sin? Sin is, a, is an evil word in some Christians' life. Oh, how dare you speak about sin? That's not politically correct. You hurt my feelings. How do you view sin? Because see, most people in a, in a place of apostasy, they know things are wrong, but it doesn't bother them anymore. They know things are wrong. They know what God's word says, but, well, maybe, I don't know. I know God says it, but, you know, maybe, maybe I should open my mind to a new progressive way of thinking. You know, the world right now is really big on social justice. And as a believer, I'm going to tell you, I believe in social justice. But the problem is that the world can't get it right. Because without Christ and without the word in your heart, you're going to be unjust in your social justice. 
What is just about killing innocent people in the name of justice? What is just about murdering and destroying businesses? What is just about that? We can't get it right as people. Only Jesus can do that. Jesus in the heart. This is why we need to be preaching the gospel. Only Jesus can change. Do you know that human beings can't change other human beings? No matter how good your message is, without Jesus in your heart, you will never truly be changed. And by the way, at the end of the day, if they don't know Christ, they will go to hell. Do you know that in the body of Christ right now, there is a movement of universalism that says there is not a hell? Christians are preaching this. People that say they love God are saying there is not a hell. Oh, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I wouldn't. There is a hell. Now listen to what he said. They give heed to doctrines of demons, deceiving spirits. There is, there is, an, there is deceiving spirits that are being unleashed on our world right now like never before because God said it would be that way. He said there would be a remnant. And I'm excited because at the same time, there is this great departure. There will be a great infilling of the church. There will be people getting saved in droves. And I want to be a part of that. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul was writing to young believers who had been told that the rapture had already taken place. <laughs> and that was happening during the, remember those movies that came out? A lot of people were saying, oh, that's ever happened. That's already happened. They were so upset, and he said, don't allow your minds to be quickly unsettled or disturbed. And this is what I want to say to you. Don't be, you know, we can be disturbed by what we see, but don't allow your minds because you're God's kid. Let no one deceive or beguile you. Every one of these passages start with don't be deceived. It must be a big thing. For the day will not come except for apostasy comes first unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come and the man of lawlessness, sin, is revealed, who is the son of doom. Now, this is talking about what's going to be happening in the last days. One, there's going to be a great falling away. There's going to be a lot of people that get involved in deception in the church, not just in the world. I mean, think about our world right now. There's always been evil. The, the, the re resolution of racism and all these horrible things that are in the world will only come from knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is the only true way people are going to change, that wickedness. And we should talk out against it. Yes, ab absolutely. But as believers, our primary job is to get people saved and preach the gospel. And I, but he says there will be a great falling away. And he said, the man of lawlessness, he's getting ready to be revealed. Now he says, now you know what is restraining him from being revealed. It's the church. The scripture talks about that the man of perdition, the Antichrist, cannot be revealed until that which is restraining him is taken away. This isn't talking, a lot of people think, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. No. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be on the earth during the tribulation. There's going to be a lot of people receiving Christ. There's going to be people getting saved during the tribulation. The, that which is restraining is us. It's the church. We are the ones that have the authority over the enemy. Of, we have authority over the devil. Jesus gave us the keys of the kingdom. We're to be doing the work of God. He said, and you know that, that what is restraining him. So as soon as the, you know, that shofar in heaven blows and the Lord meets us in the air, that's when the Antichrist will take stage. It says there's lawlessness in the world right now. It's preparing for that son of perdition. He is going to be evil, evil, evil. And he can't come center stage until he that which is restrained, which is us, is taken up. I want to be in that first lobe, right? Right? <laughs> Mark 13, verse 4. What will be the sign when these things are going to be fulfilled? They were asking Jesus. Now listen to what Jesus says. Jesus began to say to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Here we go again. 
You can't find a passage about the end days that doesn't start with, see to it that no one deceives you. Do you know that it is our job as believers to not, to keep ourselves alert and aware, to not be deceived. And as pastors, we have got, you know, some people don't want to hear what we have to say. People get mad when you preach the gospel like we preach it here. They get, we, people get offended. Some love it, some don't. You know what? I don't care. I am going to do what God said and not worry about that. I love you. I love you. But do you know what the Bible says? It says the fear of man is a snare. And there's going to be some stuff that's going to be coming that is going to topple some believers. I pray for the church. I pray for the church. Because there are going to be some in this place that are going to feel it. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and mislead many. Now, if you go into the Greek about this, most people think it's people saying, I'm the Christ. They, they think, well, it's people saying, I'm the one, I'm the Christ, kind of like the Jim Jones, drink the Kool-Aid stuff, right? But really, if you go deep into the scripture, what this is talking about are people claiming to have his name, claiming to be anointed, that people will follow, and they are not preaching the gospel, the full gospel. That is a dangerous thing. For a nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes. There will be famines. But this is merely the beginning of the birth pains. We're, we're in the beginning of the birth pains. But be on guard, for they will deliver you to the courts. You will be flogged in the synagogues. Now, this is not fun. But the gospel must be preached to all the nations. We know of some pastors right now in this country that are facing prison for opening their churches. Other businesses are open, but some have deemed the church not essential. I am telling you, the church is essential. It's essential. And so we know of some pastors in this country. This is where we are, folks. We have to be the church. We have to love people with all of our heart, but preach the truth. 2 Peter 2, 1, there will be false prophets among the people. There will be false teachers. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. And this is what I'm talking about saying there is no hell. There is a hell. There are, there are Christian churches that are embracing the philosophies of this age concerning sexuality and all of these things when the word is absolutely explicit about what, it, what God says about those things. And that doesn't mean you hate, you love people, you love everyone, but you speak the truth in love. But when you as a believer or as a church begin to embrace the philosophy of the world, now you're in danger Jude said this in one, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord our God. He's saying they turn the grace of God into lewdness. Grace, I want to just say this about the grace of God, which is so powerful, so incredible, so wonderful. The grace of God is everything that he paid the price for you. Everything that he purchased is so incredible. It's your covenant. And grace is the power to change. It's the life-changing power. It is not a license to sin. That is not what grace is. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to read this charge to you. This is what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, in light of this coming and his kingdom, herald and preach the word, keep your sense of urgency, church. I'm reading this to you as from the Lord. Stand by, be at hand and ready, whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, the inconvenient truth. 
whether it is welcome or unwelcome, as you, a preacher of the word, are to show people, this is 2 Timothy 4 in the Amplified, you are to show people, you are to warn people, You are to correct, rebuke, urge, encourage. Show them in the way their lives are wrong. For the time is coming when people will not tolerate sound and wholesome instruction. But having itching ears for some pleasing and gratifying, they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable manner chosen to satisfy their own liking, and to foster the errors they hold. They will turn aside from hearing the truth and will wander off into myths and man-made fictions. As for you, church, be calm and cool and steady. Accept and suffer unflinchingly every hardship to do the work of the evangelist. Fully perform all the duties of your ministry. I want to say this to you, and this is... (laughs) <laughs> I know it's kind of a sobering thing, but you all, you all are aware of all these things. You know, you, you see what's happening. But I want to say to you and encourage you, as the Lord always did encourage, to not be afraid because in the midst of all of this, he still knows, he still knows your needs. He'll still meet your needs. He'll heal your bodies. He's a covenant God. He will heal your relationships He will give you hope. You still have a purpose. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. It might be 50 years from now. It might be two years. I don't know when he's coming back. He said no man knows the day or the hour, but I do know he said that we would know the seasons. And I'm saying as a pastor, we are in that season. And so be excited about this. I'm going to just give you, let's, let's take... I think what I want to do right now before we end is I want to take a few minutes to pray for you. You know, I want us to to just close our eyes and let's go before the Lord and let's pray because what I want to do is I want to give our hearts to the Lord. If there's any area that you're living in right now that you know you've been away from God and this is the time, let's just repent. Let's just, as as a people, let's repent for maybe any complacency we have. Maybe, maybe we've embraced some, some of the doctrine out there and maybe we're just, God is knocking on our hearts for repentance. Father, we just come before you and we ask you to forgive us. Forgive us of any area of sin. Father, forgive us for, for complacency, being lukewarm in any way. Father God, we just, we trust you. We love you. We embrace your word. Maybe we haven't been reading our Bible Maybe we haven't been praying like we should. We all go through times like that. And I'm just saying as a, as a pastor, I've gone through times like that. There's no condemnation in Christ. Conviction is a beautiful thing because he brings us into that sweet spot that pastor talks about. Father, I just thank you that our sins are forgiven. We receive the forgiveness of sins. Lord, we, just, we're, we are walking with you. If there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let me tell you, everything else is sinking sand. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you, not just for this earth to be prosperous in every way, but to be with him forever and eternity. There is a hell to shun and there is a heaven to gain. And so for those of you that don't know Jesus, you want to come you want to come home and you want to know him as your Lord and Savior. On the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand. And I want you to say, that is me, Pastor Lara. I want to receive Jesus today as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to give you that opportunity on the count of three. One, two, three. If you want to know Jesus, lift your hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. All right, let's pray this together. Father. I thank you. Let's all pray it. Come on, even if you know Jesus, let's pray this. Father, I thank you for the gift of salvation. I thank you that Jesus shed his blood for me. He paid the price for my sin. He rose from the dead. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father. 
I accept that free gift of salvation. I repent of my sin. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, wow. Praise God.